and we're going to welcome everybody to the the May edition of Talking Trout, uh, sponsored by Wisconsin Trout Unlimited. Thanks for jumping on. Super excited to have our our guest this month is uh, Mike Miller, who's a stream ecologist with the Wisconsin DNR. Um, he's also co-authored a book, uh, um, a field guide to Wisconsin streams, which if you have not checked it out, I would highly encourage you to, to pick up a copy and take a look at it. Um, it's just chock full with, uh, with really interesting information about the, the flora and fauna that you find in and around our streams. So um, it's a really great way to, to introduce yourself to a, a lot of what's going on in the stream side around us. So, and then obviously once you kind of get that dialed in, I think that really helps, um, that helps you become a better angler. And uh, so um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Miller and maybe Mike, you could give us a, a brief bio, um, maybe talk a little bit about the work that you do with the DNR and the university, and then I'll let you jump into your presentation. So take it away, Mike. Sounds good. Thank you, Mike. Uh, scanning through the list of attendees here, I see there's at least one entomologist and several hydrologists, so it looks like I'm going to have to be on my toes. Uh, so for myself, I'm a, as mentioned, as Mike had mentioned, I'm a stream ecologist. I work uh, for the Department of Natural Resources in Madison, and I work in the Bureau of Water Quality, their monitoring section. So much of the work I do is involved with monitoring stream resources and watersheds and developing tools to evaluate stream health. I also get to work with uh, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency at, uh, for some regional and national projects. So I, I really have a great job and I uh, have to remind myself that uh, I'm a pretty lucky guy. Uh, I grew up uh, in Plymouth, Wisconsin, and uh, there's a kind of beat up little stream, warm water stream that flowed close to my house and was beat up by cattle and whatever. And I spent much of my free time playing in that stream. And now I get paid to play in streams. So that's a, a beautiful thing. Uh, Mike Kerr also mentioned, I, I teach a stream ecology class at UW-Madison and uh, tomorrow morning they're having their final exam. So I was, as I was going through my exam questions, I pulled out some uh, tidbits to share with you folks tonight. So you're getting kind of a, a uh, little taste of what they're going to be seeing tomorrow for their final exam. So with that, I, uh, I'll see if I can load up my PowerPoint here. And I th I'm going to leave it up to Mike Kerr to kind of moderate as far as uh, whether or not we're going to field questions uh, during the presentation, which I'm certainly fine with. Or if you want to, if we want to wait till the end, that that's fine too. But uh, I'll try to answer your questions as best I can. So. Uh, Mike and others, I assume you can see my PowerPoint very good. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so uh, Mike Kerr had asked me to he kind of give me a candid list of topics to talk about, and he, one of those were, was aquatic invertebrates, and that's something I've always been quite fascinated uh, uh, with and uh, spent a lot of my time at the Department of Natural Resources interpreting invertebrate data and collecting invertebrate samples, and the list goes on. I guess I feel to mention that kind of some of the current work I'm doing at the DNR is uh, speaking of invertebrates, uh, we're starting a study to look at the impact of a certain type of insecticides called neonicotinoids that are uh, being implicated uh, globally with collapses of both terrestrial and aquatic invertebrates. Most of you probably have heard of uh, colony collapse in honeybees and uh, the same mechanism that kills the honeybees with these chemicals is also impacting with uh, many other terrestrial and aquatic invertebrates as well. So that's a major concern to me and many others. Uh, and another project I just started up is to, uh, working with the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, environmental engineering students to use drone technology to not only capture stream habitat characteristics like bank erosion and buffer widths and natural features of the stream themselves, but uh, can we use artificial intelligence to have the computer uh, evaluate stream habitat. Uh, so that's kind of an exciting new project that I'm starting. I'm looking forward to uh, hoping make some advances there as well. Uh, but tonight, again, I'll, I'll talk about aquatic invertebrates and uh, their importance in streams. Uh, so just quickly uh, for uh, kind of topics for tonight. So uh, I'm going to give you guys uh, 10 and women a uh, 10 minute uh, refresher course on stream ecology, five, 10 minutes or so. Then I'll spend the bulk of my time talking about uh, aquatic invertebrates. And if, 
if I time this right, there won't be any time left over for questions. Uh, just kidding, but uh, so towards the end, maybe we'll, uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer those. Uh, so I'll certainly talk in some generalities about uh, aquatic ecology and aquatic insects, but obviously being a trout and limited audience, I'll try to uh, focus as best I can on our cold water resources in the state. Uh, so again, this general idea of some refreshers on stream ecology, you know, water of course is the living space for fish and other aquatic animals. So perhaps it's worth mentioning uh, what proportion of our uh, planet's water is uh, suitable for trout and the you know short answer is not very much we all know that the vast majority of the earth 70 percent of it's covered by oceans and uh, of the water on planet earth you can see here that uh, roughly you know over 90 percent of that is uh, salt water from our oceans and a very small percent only three percent is fresh water now if you take that three percent of fresh water and follow that next pie diagram off to the left, you can see that of that fresh water, frankly, much of it is bound up in uh, ice. Unfortunately, we're changing that equation on this planet, uh, groundwater, and then also you know, moisture in the air and in the plants and animals on the planet. And then a relatively small proportion, just 0.3% of that 3% is actually surface waters. And then if you follow that pie down to that the lowest pie in the lower left-hand corner, you can see that the uh, breakdown among that surface water, uh, the vast majority of it is uh, found in lakes, some proportion in, in wetlands, and last but not least, uh, streams and rivers, only 2%. Uh, and then, so from that total uh, volume of water on planet Earth, roughly uh, two hundredths of 1% is actually found in streams and rivers. And, and all of you are well aware that much smaller proportion of that is actually cold water that's necessary to support trout and other salmonids. Uh, so again, all of you are well aware of this, but just to offer some numbers that cold water resources, whether it's in Wisconsin or on planet Earth is a relatively rare commodity. Uh, so it was kind of turning back to Wisconsin's water resources. Uh, we have, we think we have about 22,000 streams in this state, perennial streams, again, those streams that flow year round. And if we uh, equate that to miles, it's somewhere around 42,000 miles, again, of perennial streams. So if we took all those streams and straighten them out and line them up end to end, we could encompass planet Earth over uh, 1.6 times. So, uh, you know, Wisconsin is a very water rich state. And as far as stream and river miles concerned, uh, we certainly have an impressive quantity of those as well. Uh, but also you, you all are very well for, aware that sadly not all the streams and rivers in the state can support trout. And I'm showing a breakdown of uh, uh, kind of the numeric breakdowns of cold and cool water streams that can support trout, both the numbers of streams and miles and also the, the warm water systems as well. And I have in the title here, the larger cold and warm water streams. If I plotted up all the headwater first order streams because of the scale of this map it'd just be a solid mass of blue so what we're looking at here is uh, uh, some of the larger streams of what we call strollers third order and, and larger streams uh, so again if you're not seeing your favorite trout stream showing up on this particular map uh, perhaps because it's a smaller stream uh, so what, what determines the distribution of the cold water in the state that's necessary for trout? And uh, we have to look at landscape features to better understand that. So key, key things like the bedrock under our feet, uh, you know, both the types and how deep that bedrock is. Uh, in much of Wisconsin, uh, where I live in southern Wisconsin, it's either sandstone or limestone. And much of the driftless area and, and farther up into the northwest is also sandstone or and some mix of limestone and then off the east as well. Uh, much of the bedrock geology is comprised of sandstone. Uh, so those are all very porous rocks and their porosity. They can hold upwards of about 30% of their volume can uh, be in water. So there's a lot of airspace in those types of rocks. And so they can hold a lot of water when there's snow melt or rainfall events. And if you contrast that with say, north central Wisconsin, say Vilas County or in farther north, uh, uh, we have shale and, and granitic rocks. And those have uh, very little, if not, if any pore space. So they're not very good at holding water. And, uh, uh, how water gets transmitted through that bedrock is through fractures primarily. So again, the, the bedrock geology 
can explain a lot as far as where we uh, get our water from and how much water do we uh, uh, get from the ground. And then soils can have a, a similar influence as well, depending on the depths and types of soil. Uh, in eastern Wisconsin, for example, uh, many of those soils are more tight clay soils. So uh, you know, obviously when there's a rain event or snow melt, if the soils are tightly compacted, uh, there's more chance for surface runoff versus water infiltration. So again, uh, a couple of key factors really strongly influencing the hydrology of our streams and rivers, and also things like topography. Uh, again, when we have steeper topographic relief, whether it's on the terminal moraines of, uh, say, the Kettle Moraines or uh, farther in northern Wisconsin, or the slopes of the Driftless area, that helps infiltrate water as far as during snow melt events or rainfall events that water infiltrates on the hilltops and hillsides and because the gravity moves down into the earth and then in the valley bottoms particularly in the driftless area that water expresses itself as cold clean groundwater and this idea of watershed age all of you are well aware that the driftless area was not gla glaciated uh, during the last glacial period roughly 30,000 years ago and ending probably about 12, 15,000 years ago. So the point being is that part of Wisconsin and Minnesota and Iowa and Illinois has had uh, upwards of you know 30,000 more years for the streams and those and rivers in those areas to cut down through uh, the various layers of bedrock. So those are four key factors influencing the hydrology in this state. And so you know, some of the influences that we see from those physical landscape factors are uh, the water sources. Again, uh, is the stream and river or river receiving water from surface runoff or is it from groundwater? In the quantity of water itself, there's certain uh, areas of the state that are more water bearing than others. Again, that example of up in Vilas County, uh, because of the bedrock type, and you can uh, sink well, you know, deeply into that bedrock, but it's not going to produce much water. Conversely, in the central sands or uh, southern Wisconsin or the Driftless area, there is much more water rich aquifers. So again, uh, those uh, landscape features can affect the quantity as well. And then also temperatures affected again if the stream is dominated by, by groundwater discharges can be cooler and probably have a more stable flow regime than streams say in eastern Wisconsin that are more dominated by surface runoff. Another key factor affecting stream productivity, particularly when it comes to invertebrates and fish, is the alkalinity of the water. Again, when that water from snow melt to rain percolates through the bedrock. Uh, it's picking up dissolved minerals, particularly when it's flowing through limestone or sandstone, and not so much when, we're, when that water, water's moving through fractures and granite or shale. But that uh, uh, alkalinity, in particular, calcium carbonate, is a building block for invertebrates and, and fish and many other aquatic organisms. So streams that have higher calcium carbonate levels, again, because of that limestone, are going to be much more productive than a stream, say, in north central Wisconsin, as what we term our soft water streams that have much less uh, mineral content. And uh, lastly, uh, uh, physical factors like stream gradient can influence the substrate characteristics of the stream bed. If you have a higher gradient stream, more slope, you have, tend to have higher water velocity, and that water velocity will uh, uh, move the sediment that may enter the stream downstream. So you tend to have cleaner stream beds and coarser substrate versus lower gradient streams that oftentimes are uh, soft bottom, sand bottom, silt bottom, that sort of thing. So what I'm going to do now is uh, drop in an overlay map of the larger uh, cold water streams in the state so you can see firsthand how these land for landscape formations strongly influence the distribution of our trout streams in the state. So again, the, those edges of the, when the glaciers receded, they left a lot of glacial till. And so up through like Wapak and Langlade up, you know, kind of you can see that band of trout water going from kind of central Wisconsin towards the Northeast, you know, that ridge or, or that uh, edge of the glacial till left porous gravels and sand and coarse cobbles. And so the, the uh, superficial deposits are very porous and they can uh, absorb a lot of water. So that, a strong effect there in other parts of the state up towards say Bayfield County or Ashland County up in the Northwest. And then in the Driftless area, this idea that we have these relatively steep topography with water infiltrating on the hill 
tops and then as that water moves down slope underground when it reaches the valley bottoms that cold clean groundwater expresses itself by springs or seeps into the stream so all you uh, are well aware that the driftless area is extremely uh, water rich and cold water resources again owing strongly to the fact that uh, we had this uh, lack of glaciation and uh, uh, differences in topography relative to other areas of the state. Uh, okay, so uh, so what you know? A fundamental question is: in the state of Wisconsin, we have, uh, as far as I know, right now we have 159 different species of fish in the state of Wisconsin. And of those, roughly about 100 of them will spend at least part of their life living in streams. So what determines the distribution of fish in the state? We know they're not, uh, all species are not uniformly found across the state. So uh, scientists, statisticians use a uh, statistical tool called CART, classification and regression tree analysis. It's just a kind of fancy computational effort to uh, mathematically lump apples with apples and oranges with oranges. So I took a bunch of uh, fish distribution data for the state and then plugged in a bunch of landscape factors, whether there's the bedrock geology or soil types or land cover or whether it's the watershed or forested or not, and let the computer tell me what is the big factor influencing the distribution of fish in the state. And the first thing that pops up with this type of analysis is that water temperature is the key driver. And for the, those streams that remain below 22 degrees Celsius uh, during their summer maxima, those are, uh, are cold and cool water streams. And you can contrast that with those streams that are above 24 degrees Celsius uh, during their summer maxima. And just for those that are more used to English units uh, or Fahrenheit units, uh, a quick and dirty conversion is just, for example, at uh, number 22 degrees Celsius, if you double that number and get 44 and then add 30. So to convert degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit, double the number and add 30. So point being, if the streams get above 74 degrees for much more than say a week or so during uh, late summer, fall, when we tend to have higher temperatures and lower flows, uh, that uh, signals the death for many of our cold water species. And they either need to find a cold water refuge or they're not going to persist. But again, based on this statistical analysis, there's a rel relatively small number of cold and cool water species. And I was kind of remiss. I failed. I see here that I didn't add the uh, long nose sucker, and then also uh, there's another sculpin species, but you, you can readily count on uh, two hands and almost one hand the number of core species in the state that re uh, rely very strongly on uh, are very strongly influenced by water temperature. And then we have this much bigger mix of roughly about 80 species that are more thought to be warm water species of fish. And then the, when you do this uh, continued uh, classification effort, you can see that the next biggest factor influencing fish distribution in the state is uh, the size of the stream itself. So I'm talking about cubic, cubic feet per second. So uh, our, uh, again, if you're a big fish like a sturgeon, not surprised you need larger water bodies to live in, but again, also some of these fish like big mouth buffalo or sturgeon or paddlefish, they rely on uh, plankton and other in, uh, invertebrate food sources that are primarily found in lakes or, or bigger river systems. So again, take home message in this illustration is that one, temperature is the big driver and it's most influential in it. Uh, when we're talking about trout and then other factors like watershed size. And you can continue this analysis to break down these populations into smaller and smaller groups and things like stream or river gradient are very important. And so there's other environmental factors as well. So again, this idea that the uh, uh, snow melt or rainfall uh, infiltrates on the upland slopes and expresses itself uh, in the at the base of these uh, valleys. And again, this particular stream, it feeds into the Bishop's Branch uh, and right at the base of this hill slope, uh, kind of right about here is where the uh, this headwater stream starts and you can follow it based on the marsh marigolds and tussocks of uh, sedges. But again, that water's coming out of the ground at 52 degrees year round. So you can be out here in the dead of winter when it's you know, 20 below zero out and that water's still coming out of the ground at 52 degrees. 
And conversely, in the dog days of August, when it's 95 degrees out, that water is still coming out of the ground at 52 degrees. So a very uh, thermally stable environment that's critically important to uh, trout distribution in the state. And just a one more illustration of this is that we can talk about the base flow index, how much of the stream or river's water is contributed from this cold, clean groundwater. So again, the dark blue areas on this map show where they're the highest contributions of uh, groundwater to the streams. And you can see that over in the Driftless area. And again, that band emanating from central Wisconsin up towards the Northeast is areas with some of the highest groundwater contribution to our streams, again, coming out of the ground uh, at, at 52 degrees Fahrenheit. So many people have the misconception that uh, the reason we don't have any uh, trout streams or very few trout streams in, say, Milwaukee County or Waukesha County or other Calumet, whatever, some of those eastern counties is because of intense agricultural land use or urbanization. That's not the case. You know, 250 years ago when, you know, there were no European uh, developments of, of any note, uh, you know, those streams were always warm water systems that didn't support, uh, you know, supported few if any trout. So certainly human disturbances have played a big impact on our stream resources, but there's some natural factors limiting the distribution of uh, uh, cold water species like trout as well. So in a healthy trout stream, you'll see uh, it's kind of counterintuitive. When we think about healthy environments, we think that a very healthy environment has high species diversity. Well, that is not true for our trout streams. If you have a very healthy trout stream in Wisconsin, they may have as few as maybe two species. You might have just brook trout and a sculpin species, either a mottled sculpin or a, in the driftless area, you might have a slimy sculpin. Uh, and then you might also have a, a, a brook lampreys, but again, cold water streams tend to be very species simple. A similar size warm water stream might have you know, 25 or 30 species of fish. So uh, again, cold water streams, species simple. And as those streams warm, either because they're getting bigger, because they're flowing farther down into the watershed, or there's changes in land use, or there's a shift from groundwater to more surface runoff, then we start picking up other species, whether it's the brown trout or uh, white suckers or creek chubs or common shiners or uh, long-nosed dace or johnny darters uh, as examples. So uh, again, a healthy trout stream can be very species simple. Uh, so if you could do me a favor and read this while I get a drink of water. So Seth Meek was a naturalist. He spent most of his time in living in Iowa and he occasionally wandered into Illinois and Wisconsin, uh, taking note of the flora and fauna he, he observed in his uh, kind of forays through nature. So the point in me presenting this quote from Seth Meek was that well over a hundred years ago, folks, people were starting to make the link between uh, human population growth and changing land use and the impacts we've had on our, our aquatic resources. And all in this group tonight are painfully aware that uh, us as humans had some very significant negative impacts to our aquatic resources. So uh, I would offer that uh, we need to get a handle on our uh, invasive species uh, and also the issue of climate change. If, if we don't, uh, this is what you, how your uh, grandchildren and great grandchildren are gonna be fishing in a not too distant future. And that uh, carbon graphite fly rod, you, you gave him as a gift uh, for his birthday. He's gonna be up for sale on eBay because he's trying to raise some money to buy a, a new brand new carbon graphite dip night uh, to go carp fishing. So again, we need to do a better job of managing our, managing our aquatic resources. So that's kind of my backstory on uh, uh, some key factors that uh, influence the distribution of trout streams in the state or cold water resources in the state. And I'll spend the rest of the presentation focusing on aquatic invertebrates. Uh, so many anglers, and I know trout, frankly, trout unlimited uh, members are uh, atypical when it comes to this, but they tend to be more attuned to natural resources and you know, stream resources in particular, and um, know more about the uh, 
inner workings of the food chain that I think many other types of anglers do. Uh, but again, in general, anglers tend to have a, kind of this cursory look of streams or, or thought about streams that we're obviously as anglers are keen about uh, going after some of these game fish species. Uh, but you know, that's not the whole story as far as the uh, importance or the health of our, our streams and uh, fewer people yet think about uh, the non-game species in our streams and one example being here is a, a mottled sculp and uh, again a key link in the food chain and then farther yet and again uh, trout are limited members fly fishers in particular tend to be more attuned to the invertebrate life in streams but in general that uh, you know overall human you know, community has little understanding or appreciation for these little organisms that live in our stream and they're fundamentally important. So that's gonna kind of be my uh, take home message or the case I'm trying to make tonight with you folks that the importance of these small animals. So I borrowed or stole my title slide from E.O. Wilson, who's a uh, internationally known ecologist from Harvard University. He wrote some papers and he's an expert on ants. He knows more about ants than anybody on this planet, but uh, he often points out the fact that uh, we have this kind of misunderstanding that we think uh, you know, the, the big animals on the landscape are the most important ones. And certainly humans have profoundly affected our planet, but in the natural world, uh, frankly, it's the small animals that are, are oft times, if not always more important. And just from a sheer numbers or biomass perspective, they far outweigh the, the other animals. You know, so we tend to focus on the kind of charismatic megafauna, like the grizzly bear. And I suppose as fly fishers, it's probably a good thing because they end up occasionally eating an occasional fly fisherman. But uh, oh. again, we focus on uh, these big animals, but if we're concerned about the functioning of uh, the environment, perhaps we should be thinking a little bit farther down the food chain. And uh, so animals like instead of the grizzly bears, perhaps we should be thinking more about the water bears. And if time permits, I'll uh, talk about these little creatures in a, a little bit later. Uh, so from a, like a global perspective, you know, we can think about the number of mammals on planet Earth, and we have some somewhere around 6,500 mammals, and no doubt these numbers are wildly off. And you know, we continue to identify new species, and sadly, continue to lose species as well. So, but the point is, we've got somewhere over 6,000 mammals on planet Earth, and you can <clears throat> think about this broader collection of vertebrates, whether it's a fish or a frog or a bird or a bear. Uh, so, somewhere around 70 thousand vertebrates on planet earth but just as one example uh, in the invertebrate world we have somewhere around uh, 350,000 different uh, species of beetles alone so we have just uh, looking at beetles we have like seven times more or five times more uh, beetles than we do have vertebrates on this planet so from our numbers and from a lot of other perspectives these invertebrates are fundamentally important uh, so just, you know, kind of take home message again, all, you know, nearly one fourth of all animals on planet earth are beetles and some of those are aquatic and a lot, many more of them are terrestrial and a lot of those terrestrial beetles end up falling in our streams. Uh, so just one little fun fact about beetles. Uh, so you can see on the underbelly of this particular beetle, what it has here is a, a air bubble trapped on its belly. And what many aquatic beetles have is what's called a plastron. It's like a fuzzy little patch on their belly. Uh, and what they do is they go up to the surface of a pond or a stream and they get an air bubble and they this uh, little fuzzy patch helps hold it to their body. And they use that as a, uh, their air supply. So in that air bubble is oxygen, of course. And as they use up the oxygen in that air bubble, it creates this tension between the quantity of air, or excuse me, the quantity of oxygen in that air uh, bubble becomes less relative to the quantity of dissolved oxygen in the water. And it becomes this mechanical pump actually pumping oxygen into that air bubble. So it's believed that a number of these different beetle species can grab one bubble of air and hold it to their body and use that uh, throughout their entire life. So they're, they're like the world's first scuba divers. So just a fascinating adaptation that uh, these beetles use to live underwater. Uh, so on tomorrow's exam, we're gonna 
uh, write about the river continuum concept, the fundamentally important concept. And I think for you folks as uh, stewards of these resources in the state and interested as uh, maybe perhaps armchair ecologists and interested in knowing more about your streams that you fish, I think it's good to know this concept. The most cited paper in all of aquatic resources is called it goes by this title, The River Continuum Concept by uh, Robin Van Oet and others back in 1980. It's got more people, more scientists have cited this paper than any other scientific paper on aquatic resources, so a fundamentally important paper. But the, the importance to you folks is to recognize that uh, there's this natural transition or a continuum of change in physical and chemical characteristics of streams and rivers that result in uh, predictable biological changes as well. And that can uh, be useful as you think about fly patterns and where you're gonna find uh, trout in these river continuums. Uh, so kind of from more of a graphical perspective, our headwater streams, you know, as you know, are very narrow. So they tend to be shaded by grasses and uh, canopy cover of trees. So they don't get much sunlight reaching to the stream bed. And as a result, there's very little algal growth on the stream bed. And that's a key food source for a lot of the invertebrates. So in our headwater streams, the key energy source for these streams is organic matter, leaves and twigs that wash into the stream in the fall of the year. And uh, again, the, well, those leaves, when, when they're on the trees in the trestle environment, they have chemical defenses so that invertebrates, trestle invertebrates can't eat the leaves on the trees and shrubs. Once those leaves fall off and wash into the water, uh, those chemical defenses are leached out of the leaves. And as importantly, or more importantly, the leaves get covered with what's called a biofilm. So microscopic plants and animals cover these leaves and that becomes a food source for a lot of the invertebrates that live in our streams. And it's oftentimes referred to or analogous to a, a, a cracker with peanut butter on it where the, the leaf is the cracker and this biofilm is like the peanut butter. So the uh, insects that feed on these leaves get energy from the leaf itself, but they also get more energy from the this biofilm on the leaves. So our headwater streams are powered by this organic matter washing into the streams in the fall of the year. So if we alter the landscape, we cut down the forest, we uh, cut back the streamside vegetation for urban development or for agriculture, we influence this very key energy source for our streams. So again, if we alter the landscape, we alter the food chain, for, particularly in our headwater streams. So again, uh, I was out with some students the last couple of weeks and we were sampling invertebrates and turning over rocks and a lot of these leaves, and this is not a photograph from that day, but uh, uh, but again, the, this, this organic matter, leaves get trapped among the rocks. And again, these invertebrates are feeding on this food source for well into the uh, summer season. And one example of uh, one of the aquatic insects that feed on these leaves are, are uh, crane flies and they're this FFG that sounds, stands for functional feeding groups. So how do these invertebrates make a living? Well, again, the crane flies and many other shredders, that's what they do for a living. They shred up this organic matter, these, this leaf material, and these shredders are pretty sloppy eaters. So a lot of that organic matter washes downstream and there's other invertebrates that capitalize on that food source. So the point being in the headwater streams, oftentimes we see a predominance of crane flies and other shredders. And I'll offer some examples in a couple of minutes. No doubt all of you seen adult uh, uh, crane flies. Again, the, the larval stage, uh, it, this larvae is about the size of your pinky. Uh, and uh, again, you know, it's kind of caterpillar-like. And so to me, it's kind of curious that the winged adult looks like a mosquito on steroids. Most of you have seen these, they have a kind of unique type dancing, flying motion, and they tend to be uh, hiding in the shadows during the daytime, but uh, towards dawn and dusk, they're more active. And they tend to live relatively short-lived on the wing, most of the species in the state. Uh, but uh, also they make for, for an effective fly pattern that uh, I, I see a lot of folks using in the driftless area in particular. And another key shredder in these groups and caddis flies and mayflies are among these groups as well, but uh, uh, some of the stone flies we have in this state. So again, this is a, a larval stage of a, a stone fly. In this case, the uh, giant 
black stonefly, and it's a close relative of the family Pteranocidae. Is it close relative to the western salmon flies that some of you folks have fished uh, when you go out and visit uh, streams in Wyoming or Montana? In this state, we tend not to have. Uh, in my opinion, the stoneflies tend to be a relatively unimportant component in the diet of many trout. They're uh, not found in that many streams uh, uh, relative to other species. And uh, uh, the, when they emerge from the water, they tend to crawl up on logs and, and uh, rocks and boulders, that sort of thing. So they're not exposed as much as mayflies and other species uh, uh, to trout when they're escaping from the water environment. So again, in my opinion, at least relative to the Western waters, the stoneflies tend to be relatively less important in this state. So again, they'll climb up on uh, some stream bank vegetation or rock or a boulder and then uh, move from their larval aquatic stage to the winged adult stage. And uh, as far as uh, in this state, we have uh, 54 species of stoneflies, whereas with mayflies, we have like 130 species and with caddisflies, I think we have somewhere around 230 or 250 caddisfly species in the state. So from a, a numbers perspective as well, they're not nearly as well represented as some of the other insect species that we key on when we uh, go fly fishing. And from a kind of evolutionary perspective, the, the fossil record's kind of spotty, but they're, they're known to be at least 54 million years old. And there's some evidence they may have been on planet Earth for upwards of nearly 280 million years. So when there were dinosaurs lumbering around on the landscape, there were stoneflies uh, crawling around on our stream beds as well. And also there's some unique habitats or life histories of, of some of the stoneflies in the state. And one example being the small black winter stoneflies uh, as, as shown in this example here. My first exposure to the uh, uh, winter stoneflies was decades ago when I was skiing the American Birkebiner ski race and up near Hayward, Wisconsin. And uh, one of the streams we, we crossed during the ski race is the, it's called Mosquito Brook and it feeds the Namakagan River as, uh, towards the end of the race and it, I was beat and I had my head down, uh, sucking wind and uh, looking down at my feet uh, and here what I thought was crawling across the snow, it literally was like, uh, I thought they were ants at first and there were just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them crossing uh, the snow as they were going down to the uh, Mosquito Brook. And I subsequently learned these were winter stoneflies. And the, uh, again, an interesting thing about these, they emerge in the winter time and it can be 30 below zero out. You know, you all know that uh, insects are cold blooded animals and so, now, the reason they don't freeze solid is they have a uh, glycogen in their body. So a, a sugary antifreeze that keeps them from freezing to death and they'll actually uh, burrow into the snow, particularly during very cold uh, uh, windstorm events in the wintertime to get out of the elements as best they can. But the fact that these small cold blooded animals can persist as winged adults in the uh, wintertime in the dead of winter in Wisconsin to me is pretty fascinating. So in February and March, you oftentimes see these stoneflies on the snow. So another key group of invertebrates, and these are, uh, are much more important to fly fishers, are uh, some of the caddisflies. And this example here is the larval stage of a, a net spinning caddisfly, and the, give it its scientific family name, the hydrocycids. But I would argue that nearly any trout stream that you folks fish in, if you pick up a rock and look at it closely, turn it over, and you, if you see little clumps of vegetation kind of sticking to the rock, and if you look closely, you'll see a little filtering net. And that's what we're seeing in this photograph here. And they're about the size of your fin uh, uh, pinky finger fingernails. So they're pretty tiny. But what these animals do, they're close relatives to uh, moths and, and butterflies so they have a silk gland so they spin silk and they create this little filter feeding web and so they filter out that organic matter that some of the other shredders upstream had created so a key link in the food chain creating uh, taking that plant tissue and creating uh, uh, you know a, uh, animal biomass and again in many of our streams like I fish Black Earth Creek just west of Madison fairly routinely and uh, when I go out there and sample the stream 
for work. Uh, I know that upwards of about a third of the invertebrate biomass in Black Earth Creek is made up of these net spinning caddis flies. So a fundamentally important food source for uh, animals in these streams. So if we, for some reason, if we lost these caddis flies, again, that make up a third of the stream biomass in many of our streams, say goodbye to a third of the sculpin biomass and a third of the trout biomass and a third of the uh, blue heron biomass, so a key link in the food chain that uh, uh, most of us have kind of little appreciation of. And just a close up of this particular animal where again, have, they take this silk and they create this, spin this little web. And some species have a little comb on their mouth where they comb the organic matter off the net and other species will consume the net and, and uh, spin a new one, but they can take out this organic matter that's drifting through the water column and uh, converting into insect flesh that is then subsequently converted into fish flesh. And just an example of uh, a couple of uh, patterns uh, that someone tied up that uh, does a pretty uh, good job of representing the larval stage of the caddis fly. So again, uh, caddis flies have a, what entomologists call a, a uh, a complete metamorphosis. So they go from an egg stage to a worm-like larval stage to a pupil stage. So again, if they're a case-filling caddis fly, they'll close off their pupil case and pupate in there where they quickly develop their wings and legs and antennae. And at some point they break out of that cocoon and uh, fly off as a winged adult. So they have a complete uh, metamorphosis going from egg to larvae, a worm-like larvae to a pupil stage to the winged adult stage. Whereas contrast that with uh, mayflies, they have an incomplete metamorphosis where they go from a uh, egg stage to a nymphal stage. And the uh, nymph for larvae, I should say, looks a lot like the adult minus the wings. And then, so they only have three stages, uh, egg, larvae, and, and winged adult. Uh, but again, since uh, caddis flies are quite numerically dominant in many of our streams uh, uh, and make up quite a bit of the biomass. Not surprised that they make for an effective fly pattern of fish as well, because the trout certainly key on, key in and cast flies as a key food source. And I just pull this image off the web, which is an overly ornate uh, uh, caddis fly pupa, uh, but you know, it, it also does it, to me anyways, looking, having looked at a, a lot of different uh, caddis pupa under a microscope, I can tell you it just, uh, you do, do see the long antennae and the legs that are developing kind of trailing behind it and their wings are kind of tucked under their body. Uh, so I just kind of very ornate fly pattern, but uh, again, it, it's uh, kind of artfully done. Just to give an example of, uh, of the uh, caddis fly is going to Rough, roughly about 240 species in the state of Wisconsin. And most of the winged adults, they all look like kind of drab little moths or maybe a three quarters of an inch, an inch long. And they have a very kind of erratic flight pattern over the surface of the water. And you can oftentimes see them at dawn or dusk uh, skittering above the surface of the water. Again, it's very erratic flight pad. So you can, from quite a distance, identify them as caddis flies. And, uh, you folks know, or many of you know, that uh, when you see a trout rising and having a very slashing type uh, rise to the fly, it's very indicative of that they're going after caddis flies. And the reason that is that once the caddis flies hit the surface of the water, as and once they leave their uh, pupil case and reach the surface of the water, they uh, they're ready to fly off very quickly and the trout know that if they don't catch that fly right at the water surface or before, uh, they're going to have a tough time catching it because it could be in the air, whereas things like mayflies may drift on the stream for some distance before their wings are dry enough to fly off. So again, kind of knowing a little bit about the life history of the, the insects and the behavior of the trout reacting to them can tell you a lot about what's going on as far as hatches or what, what insects are common uh, to the, that particular stream. Uh, so a super ornate uh, fly pattern. I. If I attempted to tie this particular pattern, uh, it, it'd take me about uh, 25, 30 minutes. It'd look more like something, a uh, fur ball that a cat perhaps coughed up. So I, uh, but point is, I guess, in my luck would be that if I tied something like this up, typically on about my second cast, I'd end up hanging up in a tree out of reach. And so my, 
uh, end up spoiling my whole day because I tried to tie this artful fly. So point all this rambling is, I think you're better off, frankly, using something like an X caddis where I think your success is likely to be nearly as good as some more ornate pattern. So uh, again, this is kind of more my speed of fly tying. And I use this X caddis quite often and I seem to think I do fairly well with it. So uh, if you don't have a particular cat, you know, dry fly caddis pattern in mind uh, to use, uh, I'd say add this to your arsenal. So moving on to a different functional feeding group, the grazers. So they're kind of the cows of the stream bed. On every surface of the stream bottom, whether it's a rock or a log, there's this biofilm of algae and microscopic other microscopic plants and animals. And that's what many different uh, insect species, species feed on by grazing or scraping that material off the rocks. And many of our mayflies are common examples of these grazers. And again, most of you are uh, quite familiar with the common name of the, the blue-winged olive mayfly. So if, uh, again, there's a number of different mayfly species, baited mayflies are a blue-winged olive uh, mayfly species in the state. And uh, you can see here in this photograph, there's a number that are you know small and brown and uh, all kind of fairly uniform in size. And that one in the middle is different uh, color. Well, what's happened is this uh, mayfly has molted uh, and, it, and they uh, sometimes will molt upwards of 30 or 40 times before they become a winged adult, which is very unusual with insects. But uh, mayflies go through these different life stages. Again, as they grow, they need to break out of their exoskeleton uh, and, and uh, create a new one. Uh, and so, but, so the take home message you, for you folks are is that most of the mayfly larvae in our streams are all kind of torpedo shaped, and at least for most of their life, they're kind of a brownish reddish color. And there's some certainly some color variations among species. But take home message is if you tie a fly pattern that kind of has this body shape and this body color, you're likely to be pretty successful as far as fishing uh, mayfly uh, nymph patterns. And so hence the popularity of a lot of our different fly patterns because they're effective, but uh, so they're as a result, very popular. So whether using a soft hackler, a pheasant tail or copper john prince nymph or whatever, again, they uh, having this brownish color and perhaps a, a torpedo body shape and whether you tie in some uh, shorter or longer hackles represent a drowned adult or uh, the uh, larval stage, whatever. But again, this basic body form uh, represents a number of different potential food items to a trout. And as far as you know, most of you are well aware what an adult mayfly looks like. Again, uh, in this state, we have upwards of uh, 130 species of mayflies. Uh, and again, as far as evolutionary, evolutionarily, they've been on the <laughs> planet for a, a number of years. Uh, and you know, some of you folks are quite uh, adept at. Uh, the toughest audience I have to speak to tends to be trout and limited angler, anglers because they uh, tend to be more knowledgeable about streams and insect species, et cetera, et cetera, than uh, some other scientific groups I talk to. So no doubt there's people in this audience that are much more well-versed and uh, mayfly taxonomy, taxonomy than I am. So I like personally like to uh, keep it simple. So either I can talk about uh, Betis tricaudatus, uh, or Betis brunicolor or Betis flavistriga, or I can just think, well, early in the springtime, I'll be fishing maybe like a size 16 mayfly pattern, a blue and olive pattern, and then perhaps a little bit later in the year, I'll switch to something smaller. So I see one of the fun things about fly fishing is you can keep it as simple or make it as uh, complex or challenging as you like and have fun anywhere along that continuum. So again, you can maybe key in on just the size of your fly patterns versus getting too fixated on uh, what species might be hatching out that particular month. Uh, so in Madison, we had a pretty snowy uh, winter. Well, actually, this photograph was taken in June uh, on the Mississippi River, so a hex hatch. Uh, so up close and personal when uh, uh, the hexagenia are emerging from our uh, larger rivers and soft bottom lakes and soft bottom rivers in the state and much of the upper Midwest. So most of you have probably seen these video clips before, but for those that have not, again, this was taken as you can, uh, I guess it's not listed here, but this was uh, taken at the, uh, it's a 
uh, weather radar time loop from the La Crosse NOAA weather station in the city of La Crosse. And uh, what we're seeing here is a hexagenia mayfly emergence on the Mississippi River. So uh, kind of the perfect biological storm where billions and billions of these mayflies are emerging all at once. And you know, scientists now are using radar to quantify these emergences. And it's thought that in a single night's emergency, you might emergency get upwards of 80 billion individuals and upwards of you know multiple tons of insect biomass emerging from the river just in one night. And so it's not surprising that many animal species key in their life histories to take advantage of these food sources, whether you're a bird feeding your young or a bat or a mouse or spider or whatever. Uh, again, many of these animals will key in on a, a very tremendous food source resulting from many of our insect emergencies, not just the hexagenia. Uh, so again, this idea that it's, uh, you know, these invertebrates are, are key food items for a number of different species, not just trout, but uh, again, whether it's a bird or other insects or mammals or bats, whatever, uh, again, a, a very important link in the food chain, you know, for a number of years is recognized that uh, terrestrial insects falling into streams where it was a key energy source for streams. And over the last 15, 20 years, people are just starting to make the link that actually this movement of organic matter in the form of insects out of streams and rivers is as important as well. So we're kind of learning as we go here. So again, whether you're a, a spider or a trout, uh, insects are fundamentally important. And the old, uh, uh, the old anglers ploy of when you park your car by a bridge, uh, and you're not sure what fly pattern to tie on. I'll, and I still do this. I'll go underneath the bridge and look for a fresh uh, uh, spider web and see what poor little insects are struggling in the webs and then uh, uh, proceed to tie on that uh, fly pattern. And uh, again, if, what the spiders are feeding on is typically what the trout are feeding on as well. Uh, and just kind of moving on to it, uh, different types of insects, uh, the, some of the beetles in our stream. And so kind of under the theme of man bites dog, sometimes uh, uh, invertebrates turn the tables. And here's one example where this is a giant water bug and they can get to be upwards of about two and a half, three inches in length and about the size of a, a small turtle. Uh, and, and what they do is they'll latch onto a unsuspecting uh, young trout or a, a frog or a tadpole or some other minnow species, whatever and then they inject the, their victim with a protolytic enzyme. So an enzyme that dissolves proteins. And so what this giant water beetle is having is a trout slurpee for lunch because it dissolves the uh, victim from the inside out. Uh, and I had a coworker, he retired recently, but a couple of years ago or about five years ago now, he's relaying the story that, again, he was doing some infert collecting and he you know, worked for the department for 30 years and he uh, picked up one of these beetles and got stabbed in the thumb, uh, in the fleshy part of his thumb by one of these uh, giant water bugs. And uh, he said it felt like somebody had hit his thumb with a hammer. And for the next three months, he uh, was watching as the necrotic tissue was sloughing off from, the, from his thumb. So, uh, so the point is these things are not to be messed with. You can certainly pick them up if you handle them properly, but don't be setting them in the palm of your hand to play show and tell with your, uh, uh, your friends and get stabbed by one of these. You'd be uh, uh, in a little bit of pain. So what I did is, and this is probably about 10 year old data now, but I took uh, somewhere, DNR has sampled invertebrates from streams for decades. And I took the entire database, which was, uh, since forgotten, I think it was about, at the time, it was about 13,000 samples. And I think it was like 2.x million individual uh, uh, invertebrates that were identified in the laboratory by a taxonomist uh, as part of this database. So the point is to show you a breakdown of the kind of frequency of occurrence by numbers of these different animals in, in the streams that DNR biologists have sampled. So there's no doubt all sorts of biases going on here where one, the biologists only do kick sampling and riffles for good reasons and bad, and they don't necessarily sample equal numbers of big and small streams or cold and warm streams. So this is not a, a, a nice unbiased sample of what's in Wisconsin streams, but just taking some data that I had in hand to give you a, some feel for the relative importance of these different invertebrates in our streams. 
and, and these pie charts, I just plotted some data from, uh, you know, these four streams. And so the take home message from this, I'm not, you know, I'm not expecting folks to kind of memorize or uh, kind of assimilate all these different species and where they're found and what streams. The take home message here is that streams differ as far as their uh, composition of invertebrates are concerned. And in, in, in any one of these individual streams, frankly, if you started at the headwaters and followed it down river down toward its mouth, you'd see a, a natural uh, progression of species differences as well. So the take home message in this plot is that streams differ uh, among streams and within streams as far as what kind of invertebrates are found in them. So you know, the idea of turning over a few rocks or looking spider webs, or, you know, if you're, particularly if you're not familiar with a particular stream, uh, to better understand what might be there. And obviously, if you have some familiarity with the stream, you know what, what's there as far as uh, uh, invertebrate species and what fly patterns seem to work. But again, you know, the point being is that our streams are very diverse and the uh, species found within them. So this is an interesting study and it was done about, uh, probably about 15 years ago now in Minnesota is part of the Driftless area. So this, this particular tree, this particular creek, excuse me, Valley Creek, I think it was about like a second order stream. So a fairly tiny stream, something you could probably jump across or easily wade across, maybe just guessing like five or uh, five feet across or something. So a relatively small stream. But the point is, if you look at that pie chart in the lower left, what this uh, researchers has done, they sunk nets onto the uh, into the water column of the stream. They called they're called drift nets. And the invertebrate life that's drifting downstream in the water column gets caught by these drift nets. So again, the lower left-hand pie chart is what uh, was drifting through the water column. Again, for trout, that flowing water is a conveyor belt, a cafeteria line of food. They sit in one spot and as things drift by, they go out and grab it and, and that's how they feed. So they're kind of lion weight predators. Uh, so again, this is what the trout we're seeing in that lower left pie chart. And if you contrast that with that upper left pie chart, what the researchers did was at that same time, they were collecting these drift net samples. They went out and shocked the stream and caught a number of, of trout. I believe they're mostly, oh, well, they were brown and brook trout. I'm not sure what the mix was, but point is uh, they then pumped their stomach. So uh, uh, so again, the lower left tells us what was the trout we're seeing and the upper right is telling us what they selected. So at least one immediate example is that, uh, and again, this is based on numbers, not mass or weight or whatever, but so the point is there's a lot of black flies, larvae and, and pupae drifting through the water column, but the trout tend to not, uh, not select black flies. But if you contrast that with scuds, again, there was a very strong preference for scuds uh, relative to what was drifting by in the water column. Uh, and again, certainly scuds are not necessarily great drifters, but point is, Trout are selective, and again, in this particular case, they're keying fairly heavily on uh, scuds. Now, this is just one trout stream during a couple of seasons worth of sampling, so this is not kind of a blanket statement for what trout feed on, but uh, the take-home message here in this example is that trout are selective, and again, they don't necessarily just take what's drifting through the water column as their, uh, as their food sources. Uh, so this idea that, uh, uh, scuds or first order shrimp are very important in the diet of, of trout. Again, they're a relatively large uh, prey item compared to say a small mayfly nymph or uh, some other aquatic invertebrates or insects. Uh, so again, shrimp, uh, first order shrimp or scuds, they're uh, crustaceans, they're not a, a type of insect. They're not gonna sprout wings and fly off as a winged adult, but certainly a key food source for uh, trout. Uh, so, uh, again, one of the fun things I get to do is take uh, UW-Madison students out to local streams and, and do some stream sampling for inverts and fish and stuff. And for years, we'd be collecting uh, freshwater shrimp or scuds, and the students would be looking at them and in the field and, and counting them and whatever. And every once in a while, one of the student would ask and say, hey, hey, Mike, there's this, how come this scud has this orange dot on it? And that, and I forget what my story was. I think I said, well, they're either eggs or a f uh, fat globules or whatever. And so that was my story for probably about five or eight years. And so one year we're out doing the same thing and the same question came up and I started blathering on about, oh yeah, those are uh, uh, eggs or whatever. And then uh, there happened to be a parasitologist in the class and she's piped up and she goes, no, no, Miller, you got it all wrong. That's actually a parasite. And uh, so I did some further follow-up reading on this and uh, yes, indeed, it's a parasite. It's a, 
acanthocephaline worm, a, a spiny headed worm. And uh, in order for this spiny headed worm to complete its life cycle, it has to go through from the shrimp through the gut of a fish. It doesn't necessarily need to be the gut of a trout, but it has to go through the gut of a fish. So in order for this uh, a parasite to make this scud more noticeable, it creates this orange dot within the body of the scud. And it also influences the behavior a little bit. So there's actually a study done where the scientists actually painted orange dots on the scuds or they actually took infected scuds and covered up the orange dots. And the results of the study was that, as you can read here, that those scuds with the uh, orange dots in them were uh, five times more likely to be eaten by a fish. So take home message to you folks is just to, you know, bust out your orange dubbing. And so, uh, so I've been telling this story for a number of years now, and I've had uh, TU members coming up to me at workshops and talks and icebreakers and whatever, and saying, oh yeah, Mike, I start tying in that orange dubbing and it works great. And so whether this is, you know, just, they're being delusional or they're just fishing with more confidence or this actually works or not, uh, maybe open uh, for debate. But uh, if you tie your own scud patterns, perhaps it's worth a thought to dub in a little bit of orange on, on your next uh, flies that you tie. Uh, so, you know, I've been talking a lot about the aquatic insects. Uh, you should, folks should uh, recognize that you need to remember your ABCs. Now, the, the story goes that uh, in the summertime and late fall, the water temperatures are up, the trout are more active, they're more hungry, there's fewer mayfly hatches, fewer caddisfly hatches, and that's, yeah, I, I go along with all that, but also recognize that, again, beetles are quite numerous, ants are quite numerous, crickets more so later in the uh, summer season, but point is these are all fundamentally important food items for a trout, and it, you, know, you don't need to start fishing them uh, automatically in late July or August or whatever, I'd offer you should be fishing ants and beetles throughout throughout the fishing season, whether it's in uh, May or June or July, and, and you can be quite effective. So my little story about sailboat painting, about 10 years ago now, I had a little sailboat in my backyard that I was painting the deck on. I was painting it blue, and I had it up on some sawhorses, and uh, I was spraying this light blue, blue paint on the deck of this boat, and uh, uh, much to my dis, uh, dismay, uh, whoop, my, uh, my, uh, got a technical difficulties here, bear with me. Uh, so yeah, so anyways, I'm painting this boat and, and being quite careful and I spent a lot of time sanding it, it looked great and I start painting this, spraying this light blue paint on it and again the, the boat happened to be parked uh, underneath uh, an ash tree. It wasn't a particularly big ash tree. And I sprayed the paint down. And as I was standing there for the next hour and a half, as the paint was drying, I was watching this constant rainfall of ants falling out of this tree. And every time one hit the boat, it stuck to the fresh paint. And I was uh, uh, getting heartburn every time an ant fell on the my boat because it was sticking to the paint and I tried picking them off and it made matters worse. So I just left them on the boat and it was kind of a, a painful recognition that lots of ants fall out of trees. And then it was about a week or two later, I was fishing the Big Green River and I got there midday. And so I thought, well, I'll find a spot that's a little more shaded. And so I went to an area that was a little grove of trees and I sat down and started rigging up and I, I was looking at this one little pool underneath a tree and I saw couple of fish rising and I was sitting there as I was rigging up, there's this constant uh, feeding of these fish. And so I, I go, oh yeah, those ants. So I tied on an ant pattern. And it was one of those magical days where I forget the exact number, but I think I made like five casts or six casts and caught five or six fish. And then the last fish I caught, uh, uh, it, it was on the surfaces and making quite a, a ruckus and I think it kind of put the rest of the fish down or maybe kind of cleared out the pool a little bit whatever but point is uh, I've never forgot those ants falling out of the trees and I kind of learned my lesson and then applied that uh, kind of misfortune to my fly fishing and so I tie on an ant pattern much more often these days and I'm much more observant when I am uh, fishing where there's uh, canopy cover over the, the water where there may be some uh, ants falling in. So if you, you don't fish ants, add it to your arsenal and again, uh, uh, kind of seek out those spots where they're more prone to be falling into the water. Perhaps you can increase your angling success a little bit. Uh, 
Another uh, key group in our invertebrates here are the uh, midges and I'll, I'm kind of running low on time, short on time here, so I'll kind of buzz through some of these. But again, a lot of you have midge patterns you use for the larval stage. Uh, and then the pupil stage looks like this, where they're starting to develop their wings and antennae. And those fuzzy things on its head are actually its gills. Uh, so usually when I try to offer uh, fly patterns to other anglers, is kind of the, the response I get is kind of like this guy with the uh, red plaid shirt on. So I tend to be fairly reluctant to, to offer fly patterns, but I will offer this one, as far as a midge pattern is concerned, that it's a very simple tie. And actually this is not one I tied. And I actually use a simpler pattern where I just use uh, copper wire for the body, but with a little peacock herald and a, a bead head and whatever type of wing you want to use, whether it's uh, you know, some of these synthetics, whatever, but a very simple tie. But uh, this has certainly been a go-to fly for me and I've had great success in Wisconsin and Montana and elsewhere. So a simple tie, uh, that uh, at least uh, my experience has been, it's a, a great pattern to use throughout the year. Uh, just see an example what the winged adults look like. They kind of look to me like a mosquito without a, a biting proboscis or whatever. And the males, like the one in this photograph, have these fuzzy antenna that are thought to help them find uh, females when they're mating. Uh, they not necessarily in Wisconsin, but it, well, take that back. Actually, uh, you can talk about the lake flies in Lake Winnebago, where they can coat the sides of houses. So, particularly up and farther in the north in Canada and and uh, farther uh, northern parts of North America, they have these very prodigious hatches where again the life. Uh, the summer life is very, you know, time frame very brief. And so there's this explosion of life while there's birds or insects and the midges can be uh, quite, quite impressive in the numbers that hatch out uh, in certain parts of the upper Midwest and farther north. And also uh, they're found in many of our larger lakes, whether it's something like the Madison Lakes near where I live or Lake Erie, for example. And uh, uh, so, They've been thought of as the 10th player on the Cleveland Indians team, because depending on uh, the time of year and when the direction of the wind, if it's coming off Lake Erie, oftentimes blows in lots of midges and the Cleveland Indian players are tuned into this issue. But uh, sometimes the visiting teams kind of struggle with this. So they kind of have this uh, home field advantage uh, with the midges. Uh, so I'll just kind of wrap up here. And if if uh, you remember anything of what I had to say tonight, uh, remember, and I have good authority from some of the guys I've been in contact with, but uh, uh, the take home message here is that uh, your hours spent fishing are, are not subtracted from your life. So, uh, so you need to spend more time fishing, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, so just quickly, you know, hopefully you learned a little bit more about stream ecology and why we have trout streams where we do in the state and why we have geographic gaps as well. And hopefully you got a few tips about fly fishing, who knows, and but hopefully a more kind of richer understanding of uh, kind of invertebrate life in our stream. So it may not help you catch more fish, but hopefully it'll make your angling experience a little more richer. So that, that's hopefully that's my goal for tonight. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Mike Kerr. And if uh, I'll let him orchestrate whether or not there's time for questions or uh, obviously it's getting late. So I apologize for going long here, but hopefully it was worth your time. No, I think, uh, thank you so much, Mike, for doing that. It was a great presentation and, and you had some stunning images in there and, and it really gives us a lot to think about um, as anglers when we're you know, approaching the stream. So I didn't see a lot of comments in the chat. There was uh, somebody just asked about a link to the book um, which I'm going to post this to our YouTube channel, which, um, and I'll put a link in the comments there uh, where you can find the book, but you can just search online. If you just search for the field guide to Wisconsin streams, you'll, you'll find links that will come up to that. Um, I don't know, Mike, did you want to talk at all about the book? Do you want to say anything uh, about well, it? Well, it's, it's through University of Wisconsin Press, so you can buy it through the press, so you can get it on Amazon. And, and Mike, you had kind of touched on earlier, so it, it you know, covers fish and frogs and turtles and snakes and plants and uh, mussels and uh, you know a lot of the insects I talked and vertebrates I talked about tonight so it's kind of like a, a Peterson field guide where it's you know picture image heavy and, and little snippets about each plant or animal so I'd uh, 
so I don't get any I don't get any royalties from it. So I, it sounds like I'm giving you a sales pitch. Uh, maybe I'm giving a sales pitch for UW Press. Who knows? But uh, so yeah, if you don't have a copy, I think it, you you probably get like a used copy now for about ten bucks, or I forget what the the uh, uh, price is for a new book. I think it's like twenty five bucks or something. And it, unfortunately, it's not waterproof, and I kind of wrestled with the UW Press on making it waterproof, but they had a bunch of reasons why they didn't want to do that. So kind of makes it so useless as a field guide. But uh, uh, anyways, if you kind uh, of keep a safe distance from the stream or something, perhaps uh, you can take it out in the field with them. That sounds great. I see Jason just posted a link to uh, to the book in the chat box. So thanks, Jason, for doing that. Uh, here's a good question that's probably above my pay grade. Um, is the Hilsenhoff Biotic Index a useful metric? Yes. Uh, and actually, I do. Yeah, I, I've been a big one of Hilsenhoff's disciples. I actually took his class uh, decades ago. And uh, so, yeah, so William Hilsenhoff was a professor at UW-Madison, an entomologist professor. He developed what he called his Hilsenhoff Biotic Index, or the HBI. It's based on the tolerance values of different uh, aquatic organisms. So, for example, this scud in the pattern, or the picture here is kind of, depending on the, the family it's in, it's kind of either somewhat tolerant or uh, intolerant of environmental degradation, primarily organic pollution, you know, manure, soil, whatever that takes up oxygen out of the water. So mayflies and stoneflies are very sensitive. Uh, some of the midges and uh, worms and stuff are much more tolerant. So again, the biologist goes out to the stream and collects a sample. Typically we submit them to the lab, the taxonomist counts the different animals, species of each animal found and compute this HPI. And it's used across the country. It's used across the planet, planet with some modifications. So so yeah, a long-winded answer to say that, yeah, it's a, a, a very useful biological indicator of stream health. Great. Thanks for dropping some knowledge tonight. Um, here's another good one. Uh, does the seasonal timing of the survey impact what you can find in the stream? Uh, for example, are some bugs missing after they hatch? Like, do you find less of them in the stream? Yeah, great question. So, yeah, so we try to get around. Yeah, so the answer is yes. So to some extent, uh, so we try to get around that by using what we call an index period. So we, uh, all the biologists at the DNR sample roughly the same time of year. And so we've decided that we just sample from like mid-September on. The thought being is that at that time of the year, many of the invertebrates that are uh, uh they're at a size where the taxonomists can likely identify them. Uh, and again, as we go into the winter, it's not like there's a lot of different emergences or there's a lot of number of big changes in the assemblage of invertebrates. If you contrast that with the springtime where, you know, very, very early in the year, you have stoneflies emerging and uh, midges and uh, uh, some of the caddisflies, et cetera, and then mayflies. So the point is timing can be more important in the springtime. Now, you know, typically not, you know, not all the mayflies are going to leave the stream all at once or all the caddisflies, but there's some thought that, yeah, you, because of these emergencies, you can you see some changes in the composition based on these seasonal differences. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I had a question for you. When you were showing the maps at the beginning of the presentation, you had a map and it I think it was titled base flow index map. Right. I noticed that there was kind of this big red dot like right here. And I don't know where that would be in relation to cities, maybe between like Wausau and Eau Claire, I'm guessing. Right. Yeah, so that, uh, and I, I'm kind of woefully ignorant in this arena, but I do know that's a, there's a, a lot of uh, wetlands in that area. So I don't know much about the hydrology in that area. So, so yeah, it's kind of a dearth or, you know, lack of cold water resources in that part of state, but it's certainly very wet. And that's where, uh, I forget where the town is that they have the cranberry summer celebration or whatever. So it's kind of ground zero for a lot of the cranberry operations. So it, Leads me to believe there's a lot of surface water, but evidently it's not. Uh, uh, there's not a lot of uh, discharge from the groundwater, but just more from the uh, surface water. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, I don't know. I don't see. Oh, I see somebody's got their hands raised. Uh, if if you just want to hop on and ask a question, feel free right now. I. Don't know if you can hear me or not. I can. I can. Okay. Um, you said that in in uh, low order streams, um, diversity of of 
vertebrates, fish, tends to be low. What happens with invertebrates in, in you go from low order to higher order streams? Uh, so my experience has been, uh, and this primarily more in the Driftless Airway, uh, where I've seen that, you know, particularly right where the uh, water's discharging from like a hillside or a spring or a seep or whatever, depending on that aquifer, that frankly, the oxygen levels can be a little bit lower than else, you know, farther down in the system. And, and it's very cold and, and that can sometimes be uh, water temperature can influence the development uh, stages or the cycles of the invertebrates. And also there is fewer food sources. Uh, again, these small streams are more shaded off times because uh, they're narrow. And so the grass or trees can canopy cover, can cover up this the stream. So there's not a lot of algae growing on the stream bed and other microscopic plants and animals. And so they rely more on the this organic matter washing into the stream. So uh, my experience has been that again, in the headwater streams, you kind of got this kind of rainbow shaped distribution or they call it a bell shaped distribution where these small streams you got low species diversity and as you go downstream you start picking up more and more species because the canopy is opening up there's more food sources there's more habitat types uh, there's frankly more uh, living space water volume uh, and so you see the in numbers increase and then at some point you start dropping off again where the water is perhaps warming up or the water velocity is slowing down and uh, there's a real critical habitat, these interstitial spaces between rocks on the stream bed. That's fundamentally important stream habitat for invertebrates and some fish species. And then as you get farther down in the system, as you many realize, you see kind of more uh, sand and silt because the streams, the river's flowing at a lower velocity. It's kind of lost some of the energy to carry that uh, uh, mineral material downstream. So you have more of a sandy bottom stream. So again, you get this uh, headwater streams, relatively low diversity. As you move downstream, it increases, 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 and at some point it hits this asymptote or high high spot and starts dropping off again. So, so that's my kind of interpretation of that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Interesting. I see uh, Robert had his hand up, and it uh, looks like he put the question in the chat. So I appreciate that. Um, he asked, "What do you see as changing in the next ten years or so?" Or, or maybe to phrase that in a different way, have you seen changes? in the populations of the insects over the over time and what do we expect to see in the future yeah yeah I, frankly let's see one i, I just started a, it's been a side project so it's been painfully slow but i've taken this entire dnr database and, and, and again millions of specimens and i'm slowly kind of cleaning up this data set so i want to try to get at that particular question of you know what kind of changes have we seen over time and to kind of tie it back to this hilsonoff guy when he developed his hbi back in the 70s he went and sampled about 50 or 60 streams in the state so what i'm going to do this summer is go back and resample his streams to see his stream sites to see how they change from the 70s to now but but frankly and not to be alarmist but I'll get more information out on this and I'd be more than happy to present this to uh, to this audience. But again, these chemicals that I've been talking about, these insecticides, again, they're called neonicotinoids. They're close, they're a synthetic derivation of nicotine. Uh, nicotine in plants, uh, plants produce nicotine uh, to kill insects. So whether it's tobacco or actually tomatoes and uh, Donald Blank and what other plant species, some fairly disparate types of plants all produce nicotine to kill insects. And so now uh, we're applying this to our crop fields and just, and, and not to be sound alarmist, but uh, a quantity of uh, this insecticide, the size of a, a granule of sugar. So one little sugar grain out of your sugar packet, that's enough to kill uh several thousand honeybees and actually it might be like 20,000, some crazy number. I have that written down someplace. But the point is we are applying tons and tons and tons of this stuff on our fields each year in this state. And uh, it's great at killing pest species like cutworm and uh, whatever else is uh, in the corn fields or soybean fields, but it's also very effective at killing uh, aquatic insects and trestle insects. And point is there's been uh, just this exponential growth in scientific papers across the planet showing that these chemicals are having real profound effects. And so my fear is that's happening in this state and we don't necessarily have a good handle on that. So it's something I, I need to work on rapidly to uh, one, educate the DNR administrators and the uh, folks concerned about streams that, you know, we need to take a close look at these chemicals because I, again, based on the literature, there, there's some pretty ominous signs. Yeah, 
that sounds like something we'll we'll be keeping an eye on as well. Um, Henry had an interesting question, uh, wondering if you could talk about the different forms of aquatic insect drift. Okay. Um, no. <laughs> Let's see. No, I, uh, you know, I, I know as much as uh, you, you, many of you folks know more than I on that particular uh, topic. I've certainly set drift nets in streams and seen these spikes and uh, drift in the, at dawn or dusk. Uh, and certain species are more prone to drifting than others. And as I understand it, yet there's not necessarily a, a strong scientific answer to why these animals do this. But for those that have not heard of it, again, aquatic invertebrates and six in particular, uh, let go of their perches on the stream bed and just drift downstream. So whether they're looking for greener pastures or what, I'm not certain. That's been known for some years now in a, in a more relatively recent uh, maybe not that recent, but anyways, point is a lot of these animals actually move upstream fairly impressive distances as well. So things like those freshwater shrimp or scuds, there's been some studies where they uh, label the invertebrates with uh, radioactive materials and they could track their movement upstream. So these animals will actually move upstream against the current some distance, like, you know, a few hundred meters over the course of a summer. So something that's uh, and that's kind of extreme distance. But anyways, they move great distances and mayflies make upstream movements as well. And uh, so anyway, so there there is this uh, movement upstream and down. And also there's this innate movement of the adult, the winged adults that when they hatch, they typically fly upstream. The theory being is if those animals didn't continually keep moving upstream, they'd get washed out of the system. So, so there's some neat movement patterns there that I'm just, I just have kind of a cursory knowledge of. And that kind of what I just mentioned is pretty much the extent of it. Can, can I add something? Yes, please do. <clears throat> yeah, um, I've been interested in, in insect drift and th there are several ways that they do it. Uh, there's, there's a daily drift where insects let go and they drift during the day. There's also nocturnal drift that, uh, as Mike said, occurs usually twice every evening but there's also what's called catastrophic drift in which if a stream floods, a lot of the insects <clears throat> get washed downstream and a significant portion of the insect mass can be washed downstream during these uh, catastrophic floods. And the uh, upstream migration of caddisflies and uh, mayflies and, and midges uh, during their mating flight, you'll see them moving upstream, is thought to be a method of redis redistributing the eggs back upstream because if there was no upstream mi <clears throat> migration, all the aquatic insects would end up in the ocean. Right, so right. it's, it's uh, a biologic ad adaptation of redistributing and repopulating the stream both upstream from the egg laying and downstream, if, if for, exam for example, if there was a uh, poisoning of the stream by, by, a, um, by a farmer <clears throat> from uh, pesticides uh, and that killed all the insect life and there was no uh, behavioral or nocturnal drift, it would take a long time for that area to be repopulated by insects. But with, with the uh, daily drift and nocturnal drift, uh, it gets repopulated by uh, the upstream populations in a much shorter time. So th that's what I've read about, about these forms of insect drift. Yeah, and th those are all great uh, key points. I, I appreciate those. And you know, the, the one you mentioned with the kind of catastrophic drifts, you know, that's kind of an, uh, definitely a key one. I think all of us have probably seen uh, uh, just, you know, these gully washer events where uh, it looks like, you know, the, every stream, every stone on the stream bed has been sandblasted. And so, yeah, so not surprisingly, those animals, many of those uh, that can't burrow down to the, into the gravel or tuck underneath the stream bank are going to get blown out, you know, down river. So, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because that's, you know, that is obviously pretty catastrophic. And then this idea that when you have uh, kills in streams, whether it's fish and in, invertebrates, that oftentimes you have these little tributaries that, you know, weren't exposed to the insecticide or manure or whatever it was, and they can help recolonize uh, those reaches that, you know, have been wiped out. So and there's been, sad to say, no shortage of studies in that respect because of these routine fish 
kills and insect kills where uh, again the the bright spot and all this is that uh, uh, that Henry kind of alluded to that they can recolonize the streams relatively quickly. So uh, again, the invertebrates are going to respond much more rapidly than the fish will. And, and uh, so obviously mother nature is pretty resilient and good at healing herself when given half a chance. Yeah, Tom Rosenbauer like has, <clears throat> uh, just to add that Tom Rosenbauer has, has written about uh, timing your your uh, early morning fishing trip or your late evening and early early nighttime fishing trip to correspond to those uh, two times during during the uh, nighttime in which there is this this uh, um, uh, two times of drift during during the night mm -hmm. and at least from what he writes the the fishing will be better at those times because you're, you're nymphing at a time when there is this insect drift going on. I don't know if that's true or not, just something I've read. Mm -hmm. no, that sounds interesting. Mike, Mike, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, hi. Uh, I, I tuned in late, so maybe I didn't hear uh, this commented on, but I think Henry's touching on it. Uh, for, the, for the upstream dr drift or the upstream movement, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that is by winged, uh, the winged uh, forms, right? You bet. And, yep. uh, and I'm not sure that was mentioned. And then, and then this uh, thinking back to uh, uh, aquatic ecology classes from decades ago, again, this was often described this early morning and, and, and uh, let's see, early morning and early, early evening, just at, at the beginnings of dawn and the latest part of dusk, that's when the fishing is so good because the nighttime drift has started and the fish can still see the see what they're after. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So be sure, be sure to go fishing at 3:30 in the morning for heaven's that, sake. That, that's know? right. That's right. <laughs> Another reason to get out of bed. So hey Mike, I think we could probably ask you questions all night, but I'm gonna cut it off. There was one more I wanted to get to. Tom had asked, um, how do the high tannins that are found in a lot of the northeastern rivers, do you find that that affects the the types of invertebrates that are in those streams. He was asking specifically about rivers like the Pine and the Popple. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on the fringe of my knowledge there. I, I do know uh, they talk about dystrophic lakes where there's they have these tannins, and I so so I think there is some reductions in uh, lake productivity, and I think that may hold true for rivers to some extent. But uh, beyond that, I'm I'm speculating. Uh, so yeah, it, my understanding is yes, the tannins can have an influence. And I think it tends to be a more of a it reduces stream productivity and certainly lake productivity. Uh, but that all that's as far as I can go with any confidence. Yeah, sounds great. Well, hey, thanks again. We really really appreciate you taking some time tonight and and sharing your knowledge. It was a wonderful presentation, and uh, I know you have a test to give in the morning, so. Um, right. We all feel confident that we can pass, so hopefully you <laughs> as well. That's right. I'll be waiting for your tests to come pouring in and uh, score those for you. That sounds great. Thanks again, Mike. Really all appreciate right. having you all on right. tonight. Oh, thank you. I appreciate again. the opportunity. Yeah, and uh, I'll I'll get this posted to the Wisconsin Trout Unlimited YouTube page um, within the next couple of days. Here, folks want to come back and revisit it. So, thanks again, everybody. Sounds great. Take care. Bye now.